I have been a mental health professional for over 35 years, getting doctoral training at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee in the early 1980s, and doing clinical work in order to put myself through the doctoral training program and support my family at an African-American medical center called Meharry Medical College. I really got a second doctorate by working at Meharry Medical College because of the important knowledge and skills I gained by working with persons of African descent, which led me to get a cleaner, a clearer understanding of the mismatch between traditional counseling and psychotherapeutic interventions and persons in the African-American community and our society. Lessons that led me to conclude that culturally competent and social justice minded individuals need to balance work that is designed to increase the sense of personal responsibility with clients from marginalized and devalued groups with keen and thoughtful interventions with other like-minded persons to change environmental conditions that support short-term goals and outcomes as well as working much better to sustain long-term positive outcomes that result in the mental health of larger numbers of persons from marginalized and devalued groups than has ever been done in the past by mental health professionals. Since my graduation in 1982, I've continued to work tirelessly with other allies in the field to help develop a greater understanding and practical strategies through my teaching in graduate schools, through my research findings and my presentations both in the United States and other areas. But most importantly, it has been the challenges I've faced working in various communities to help promote personal responsibility as well as environmental changes that are intentionally designed to ameliorate the problems of racism, sexism, classism, ageism, and other cultural forms of oppression that adversely impact the healthy development of millions of people in our society, which are preventable by addressing both the need for individuals and the desire to gain a greater sense of personal empowerment, as well as fostering environmental changes in the schools, universities, workplaces, community mental health centers, and other organizations where counselors and other allied professionals work. Yes, the social justice paradigm is rapidly impacting the various fields in the mental health professions and the increased attention and popularity and effectiveness of social justice counseling and advocacy strategies is realizing our untapped potential to positively impact the healthy development of larger numbers of persons from diverse cultural populations than we have in the past and that is done through the courage and risk-taking and commitment of individuals who have helped formulate and found the social justice counseling and advocacy movement in the United States. It has been my honor and privilege to have worked with others in convening a series of meetings during the American Counseling Association's annual conferences in the 1990s. These meetings focus primarily on the ways in which participants at the meetings understood and were concerned about the unintentional perpetuation of racism, classism, ageism, and other forms of cultural oppression in the work they do by implementing traditional forms of counseling and psychotherapy that, I, that emerge from flawed, empirically supported data and published research results. These individuals had energy and vision and, and a drive 
to transform the mental health professions, as well as positively impact the quality of life in the United States of America. As a result, we convened a larger meeting in the late 1990s in which we worked together as allies to outline and put together a guideline, a roadmap to first become an interest group in the American Counseling Association and two years later to become a new division in which we would have a voice in the world's largest counseling association. Once again, we flourish because of the courage, the risk taking, and the commitment individuals made, even to the point of pushing their own self interests and power and prestige and privilege as educated professionals. Secondarily, to the risk taking that they took to address racism and other forms of cultural oppression within the counseling profession itself, challenging counselor educators to become more aware of their insensitivities as they trained the next generation of counselors with theories and skills that have since been proven to be ineffective in working with persons in marginalized and devalued groups. We have opened a new chapter in the history of the mental health professions by supporting and growing the multicultural counseling competency movement. And presently, over the past decade, we have worked together as advocates in the social justice counseling and advocacy movement to complement and expand the multicultural counseling movement in the professions. Like all organizations, the social justice counseling and advocacy movement has gone through a period of evolution, which has resulted in positive achievements and an expansion of our awareness, knowledge, and skills as it relates to the new types of collaborative ventures working together with clients to negotiate ways in which we can be culturally responsive and foster the liberation of individuals who are not only able to do what traditional counseling and psychotherapy practices often end up doing, which is to foster new coping strategies that clients leave counseling and psychotherapy to deal with the ongoing dysfunctionality of family systems, of school systems, the oppression at universities and workplaces and community agencies and places in our own states and nationally that continue to perpetuate white superiority through the use and implementation of white racism in its various forms. These individuals did not flinch in terms of their risk-taking ability and courage. But over the past several years, as a researcher and an author, I have noticed that the evolutionary pattern has slowly but clearly moved into what I refer to as the devolution, not the evolution, but the devolution of the counseling profession and other allied professions in terms of further advancing the principles of the multicultural social justice counseling movements by reducing the level of courage and risk-taking and the increasing of protection of professional self-interest and annual salaries instead of fulfilling our moral responsibility by modeling after persons like Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X, to name a few, who have demonstrated to us the tremendous potential of helping ourselves and other people realize untapped potential for health and well being and justice and peace in our society. Sadly, a number of colleagues and friends that I've worked with over the years who clearly and enthusiastically demonstrated high levels of courage and risk-taking 
have from my observations contributed to the devolution of the multicultural and social justice counseling in advocacy movements. Recently, I have sent these colleagues and friends a letter that expresses my disappointment and deep concern about the violence of the silence that is manifested by leaders who have changed their attitudes, have lessened their courage, have refrained from being involved in risk-taking activities and the sort of commitment for change, once again, that puts considerations for annual salaries, that puts one's own sense of professional importance, prestige, and status, as well as looking at other cookies, as I refer to them, that come along with cooling it and resisting to be vocal and to speak truth and to confront injustices at one's own workplace, as well as in other aspects of the environments that adversely affect our clients. I want to read this letter without disclosing the names of the leaders. I will say that the persons, colleagues, and friends that I sent this letter to are former presidents of the American Counseling Association, are former presidents of the Counselors for Social Justice Association in the American Counseling Association, are leaders and former presidents of the Association for Multicultural Counseling and Development, individuals who through a renewed sense of courage, risk-taking, and commitment can help us move from devolution to ongoing evolution of a paradigm of new guidelines that help to transform not only the mental health professions by fostering a greater level of healthy human development, but contribute along with the work of other allies in various fields to the transformation of our own society much in need of increasing principles and realizing justice in different forms, as well as promoting peace in our day. This detailed letter covers a number of issues that have led me to make this video to share with you. One, to unveil, to make real clear how individuals are retreating from the inspiration and courage and commitment and risk-taking that are necessary for the sort of transformational changes and success of the multicultural social justice counseling and advocacy movement. And number two, it's an effort to disclose my hope and my faith in individuals who have worked previously at a much higher level of courage, risk-taking and commitment to change our world and our society in these difficult and violent times. Let me proceed without necessarily identifying these individuals by name. I begin as someone who has lived and continue to work in Hawaii for the past 25 plus years by stating aloha everyone. While I write this message to you in the spirit of best wishes and good health to you and your loved ones, I also send this message to express my disappointment and deep concern. Our nation has and continues to be impacted by levels of racism, injustice, and crazy thinking and crazy behaviors that are so contrary to the look nice values espoused by our professional organization, resulting in an almost total absence of reactions and increased advocacy by the vast majority of counselor educators, practitioners, and students who somehow have decided to escape initiating important discussions of injustice and healthy human development in our professional listservs, listservs that provide time efficient ways of communicating ideas and stirring the pot for discussion among thousands of colleagues and students in the field, as well as stimulating new knowledge 
and discussion among other allied professionals. I express that I'm very concerned and very disappointed in many of the ways in which you have moved to a level of silence and reframing from risk-taking and commitment for open and confrontational change in our profession and in our society. And the failure of each of you to exercise a greater level of professional and moral leadership by taking a lead to initiate discussions and calls for action that are related to the most pressing multicultural social justice issues of our time, especially initiating these discussions on our listservs. I want to emphasize that I'm aware of the individual efforts by some of you to address racism and other injustices in our country. And I do believe that none of you do so in ways that sufficiently place your professional status and financial incomes in any serious jeopardy. Having been the first and only faculty member at the University of Hawaii who filed a formal complaint about the perpetuation of institutional racism against Native Hawaiians at that university, I indeed can talk firsthand about my experiences in having serious financial and emotional retribution operating as a whistleblower in dealing with these serious issues. I knew in advance that the risks of using this strong advocacy to press the University of Hawaii to address its own racism and clearly, on my part, I did miscalculate a sense of justice, decency, and fairness by the Dean of the College of Education at that time, as well as many of my colleagues at the university, some of whom I was particularly surprised at how they continued to place their own self-interest and economic security before principles of justice and peace at the university. Having experienced these troubling miscalculations, I have often wondered how well each of you have been doing and willing to take serious professional risks to strongly advocate for the eradication of institutional racism and other forms of organizational oppression at your own workplaces. In this message, I am here to do something that all people, including all of us, do, and that is to make some judgments. My judgment, as flawed as you may believe it to be true, is that I have sadly and with much concern watched a lack of your important voices in helping to address the moral issues of our day openly and conveniently on public listservs in our profession. I often wonder what has happened to the strong, courageous, and effective voices of those who have formulated the original list of multicultural counseling competencies, explaining how the need for multicultural counseling competencies helps us to move away as traditional handmaidens of the status quo, and yes, as tools of oppression in our work as professional counselors in the field. I wonder what has happened to one of the leaders in the multicultural counseling movement about the violence of our collective silence, which he has talked about in his publications. The collective silence that results in failure to addressing injustice, including but not limited to the murders of hundreds of unarmed black and Latino persons on a regular basis in our nation, as well as the millions of innocent persons who are victims of the madness and inhumanity of our so-called leaders, including the indefensible executive policy to assassinate persons considered terrorists, as well as the evil drone policy resulting in increasing numbers of innocent deaths via the implementation of President Barack Obama's power to implement such deadly actions. 
Like others, I would say, be careful, President Obama, for God and Jesus and Allah and the Buddhas are watching and are unhappy with these death orders. They are equally not happy with the violence of our silence. Why hasn't any one that I'm addressing this message to explicitly called for an expansion in the theory of microaggressions that focus on macroaggressions that have an insidious and negative effect in the healthy development of millions of persons in our society? Where are the calls of the feminist leaders in our profession related to the violence against women in general and the recent injustices and evil statements articulated by Donald Trump. Isn't Trump's situation, which represents the sort of misogyny of many men in our country, isn't that enough reason for female leaders to address these injustices in some fashion on our listservs? Now, before the women who I am addressing this letter to get defensive, I strongly, I want to repeat, I strongly agree that men in our professions are responsible to play an equal role in addressing the forms of violence that continue to perpetuate the epidemic of violence against women in our society. But the women who I am addressing this letter to carry individual and collective reputations and legitimacy and respect that are equally, if not more important, by such advocacy efforts by lesser known and lesser respected male allies in the field. Where are the publicly expressed concerns on our listservs about the inhumane and unjust racism directed against Latinos and the unjust, inaccurate, and violent statements made by other politicians in our society. To the women who I am addressing this letter to and other allies, your work could play a powerful role in the sort of social justice advocacy for dignity and development of Latinos, Latinas in this regard. So as someone once said, where is the beef? Where is the initiation of discussions? Where is our commitment in risk-taking? Where is our commitment to advocate for uncomfortable and unpleasant realities that result in adverse psychological outcomes among millions of people in our society? Why is there no mention of the fundamental injustice of the unprecedented redistribution of wealth a redistribution that unjustly has directed to the ultra-rich in the United States in ways that are adversely impacting the health and well-being of millions of middle class and especially poor families. Where are the initiation of discussions that were the centerpiece of the origins and establishment of the Counselors for Social Justice and Multicultural Counseling Movements? Where are the calls on our listservs about the immoral wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the use of drones to kill innocent persons by the Obama administration? Why have I not seen anyone who is addressed in this letter to be truthful in unveiling the immoral and illegal nature of these wars? as well as previous interventions of death and evil behaviors in Panama, El Salvador, Nicaragua, South Africa, and Vietnam, to name a few, as well as articulating in clear terms the relevance of these illegal and immoral military actions for the work counselor educators, practitioners, and students do when working with veterans who are part of a movement referred to as Veterans Against the Wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that was preceded by large organizations entitled Veterans Against the War in Vietnam. Why are we remaining silent? And do we recognize the violence of our silence? 
I believe most of you do. Why aren't any of the persons I'm sending this letter to articulating the role that counselors and other allied professions can play in addressing and preventing the poisoning of the children in Flint, Michigan, from the toxic water in that city and many other cities across the country whose infrastructures are crumbling and at high risk of poisoning residents in large numbers across our country? Why is there no mention on our listservs by any of you who have founded the Organization for Social Justice and Multicultural Counseling about the bombing of the United States on Syria in violation of agreed upon peace negotiations with Russia and the role that multicultural social justice advocates can play in addressing this form of human misery and death in ways that promote peace at home and justice abroad. Why has no one that I'm sending this letter to called upon the American Counseling Association and the American Psychological Association to publicly address the need for national interventions, not merely those sort of dusty professional resolutions that hang on shelves somewhere in these organizational buildings, but national interventions and a call of conscience to implement violence prevention strategies that support the dignity and the development of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered persons, and especially initiating discussions about ways to prevent the sort of, the sort of slaughtering of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered persons we witnessed over the summer in Orlando, Florida. There is violence in our silence, and I'm sadly disappointed that we don't see the initiation of important discussions by us on our listservs that help expand the impact and the evolution of the multicultural social justice counseling movements. Why has no one called upon other organizations to join together along with an association called the Social Justice Creations website to unify in a national effort in a national project called the Call of Conscience to address these and other injustices. Why are these discussions about mutually supporting one another and other organizations taking a lead to promote justice not taking place? There are persons in the American Counseling Association who advocate for the addressing of school bullying and that is a good idea. But by not tying school bullying into the culture of violence that Malcolm X stated was as American as apple pie, represents the sort of intellectual and professional dishonesty and oversimplicity that the whole issue of school bullying, as presented by so called leaders in the field, may fool some of the people regarding the factors that underlie school bullying some of the time, but it won't fool all of the people all of the time who are looking for leadership that is grounded in acknowledging and discussing the roots of violence. Why has no one included in this mailing publicly addressed how injustice and violence of Native American Indians are being subjected to such unlawful and horrific forms of physical support and arrest that we witness on the media in their protestations to address what is referred to as scientifically verified facts about the long-term impact of the continuing toxification of our Mother Earth. I'm asking you this believing that you do understand. But let me ask it anyway. Do any of you really know what the Native Americans are trying to say to us? 
In part, they are stating that we are all approaching a time of no return, as many scientists have pointed to, a point of no return in terms of the future viability and ultimate extinction of the human species due to climate change. It's important for you and I to take the risks, assert the courage, and make a commitment to initiate conversations on our listservs at at least a minimum of initiating conversations that link the potential for the discontinuing viability of the human race in the long term with the relevance and the roles that counselors play as part of the mental health system in our society. Why has no one that I'm sending this message to raised the important need to address the epidemic of domestic and child physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, abuse of our sisters and children in a broad way on our listservs? Isn't this epidemic important for social justice advocates to initiate discussions? I want to emphasize that the initiation of such discussions should not be left only to be addressed by women in our profession, but it also requires advocacy by men in our profession. And I really do think that you are obviously aware of the need for all of us to minimally initiate discussions together, men and women, to address this problem. In the past, one of the outstanding African American persons who this letter is addressed to, has demonstrated the sort of moral respectability that can and has influenced the consciousness of people in the mental health professions. His voice has, ca has carried to some of the listservs in the past, stressing the importance of the important roles that counselors can play in taking action to deal with racism in our society. Unfortunately, however, the recent lack of this African-American genius's voice of reason on our listservs have contributed to the devolution of the multicultural social justice counseling and advocacy movement. Still, this individual's personal, spiritual, and professional power can and has indeed acted as a magnet, drawing other interested and motivated people by working with like-minded organizations to develop and implement action plans to address specific challenges that he has previously briefly described in passionate and clear ways. Now, I do have some differences with this respectful colleague, friend, and brother on practical strategies for future actions. More specifically, this individual has reminded me and others that this is a time for young people in our profession need to take a leading role in addressing the moral crises and injustice that adversely impact the health and well-being of millions of people in our society. However, my disagreement is twofold regarding the articulation of this point. First, the concept that this dedicated African-American scholar and leader expresses unintentionally reflects a form of ageism that simply is not appropriate or consistent with the social justice movement in our society. Second, the mental health professions has and continues to implement, and you know what I'm talking about, our professions and our training programs have effectively implemented effective screening mechanisms that help to eliminate those persons of color who have the sort of rel revolutionary and militant character that was respected by the pioneers who led the founding of the multicultural counseling movement and the birth of the social justice counseling and advocacy framework. I have asked another person who has sent this letter if he could name 
the number of persons who demonstrated a strong commitment for dealing with controversial and risky multicultural social justice issues in ways that reflect a genuine commitment for revolutionary action. This person could only come up with one name, a person who is a strong advocate of liberation psychology, but only one name, a person who has survived scrutiny to perpetuate and build on the revolutionary consciousness of the founders of multicultural and social justice counseling. I don't know of any current white person in the counseling profession whose courage and commitment in action that involves risk-taking and danger matches the pioneers who founded the multicultural counseling movement. Do you? That includes white persons that I am sending this message to in this mailing. How about the persons of colors who demonstrate their commitment to push forward the essence of what it means to be a human being and social justice professionals by working against the odds in times of challenge and controversy? And not only in times that Dr. King reminds us of comfort and convenience. Wait a minute now. Though not in the counseling profession, I would readily acknowledge that Mr. Tim Wise is perhaps the most courageous risk taker as a white person whose decades of risk taking, courage, and commitment as a strong and effective anti racism ally is most admirable. When I think of some of the youthful names of persons of color in the American Counseling Association, that are popularly spread as potential leaders in the future of the multicultural and social justice movements as they fit the characteristics outlined by Dr. King and Gandhi. There are several names that come immediately to mind. However, as I list these persons' names to you, do any of these individuals, in your view, reflect the risk-taking efforts to reform, to demonstrate the courage and transformational commitment that transcends liberal efforts to advocate for lesser threatening and challenging reforms. Reforms that unintentionally help to perpetuate the vestiges of white superiority and white privileges for return of crumbs of reform that are not a substantial threat to the status quo in the mental health professions in general and to the counseling profession in particular. No, I can't call a young person of color in the counseling profession who is consistently advocating, demonstrating the courage and risk-taking and commitment to go beyond simple reforms to articulate as many of the pioneers in the multicultural and social justice counseling movement have demonstrated calls and actions for transformative and revolutionary change, changes that will guarantee our relevance and viability as part of the mental health care system in the future. There are other issues that I have raised and identified individuals in this mailing, but I want to conclude by reading the following. Finally, I have suggested that I would work with the Counselors for Social Justice organization to host the National Social Justice Counseling and Advocacy Conference via computer technology. Although I have volunteered and recommended that a national, the first national social justice counseling and advocacy national conference take place to revitalize the evolution of the principles that the founders of the Counselors for Social Justice Association articulated and used as fuel to energize this association. I've been told that 
No, the organization is not likely to use their financial assets, which I believe are currently more than $45,000. To allow and support a broad-based opportunity to move the multicultural social justice movement beyond maintaining the status quo by implementing various reforms. Yes, maintaining the status quo by being satisfied with insubstantial reforms rather than advocating with our courage, our risk-taking, and our commitment for greater and more substantial transformative actions. I know that there is one person in this mailing who gets very nervous when I use the following term, but I want to strongly suggest that the current deterioration of the moral character, deterioration of our democracy, and deterioration of justice of our nation and within the mental health professions begs for a true societal and professional revolution. Given the demographic transformation of our nation, a cultural revolution has and will continue to be unleashed in our society in the coming decades. The question that I think is central to all of us is, will our allies, will our colleagues, will counselor educators, will practitioners who self-identify as social justice advocates truly demonstrate the courage and risk-taking required to move beyond what could arguably be viewed as being serious and ongoing forms of devolution in the multicultural and social justice movement. I want to conclude at this point because this letter highlights some of the serious challenges we face, as well as unveiling how there appears to be a growing tendency to put self-interest, professional privilege and status, and financial security in advance of a true commitment to take risks to follow in the footsteps of Dr. Martin Luther King, who made the ultimate sacrifice, to follow in the footsteps of Malcolm X and Fred Hampton and Cesar Chavez and Mahatma Gandhi and many other people in society who demonstrate to us the ability to realize untapped potential that is part of human beings' innate capacity to demonstrate justice, love, and peace in our world. I want to conclude this video by challenging each of you who view this video to respond in some shape or form with your own reactions. In this regard, I'm trying to model how to initiate the courage, risk-taking, and commitment to unveil many of the truths that we would like to avoid dealing with. I also want to conclude this by acknowledging my love and care for the individuals with whom I've sent this mailing and for their past achievements and in the hope that they will move to greater levels of courage, risk-taking, and commitment to regain and re-instill in each of us the commitment to move forward and transform our profession and our society at large. As a practicing Buddhist, I conclude my lectures with a chant that we use twice a day that can be translated into, I dedicate my life to the mystic law of cause and effect through sound. Nami oho renge kyo. Nami oho renge kyo. Nami oho renge kyo. All in the hope of peace and justice and for us to gain a sense of courage and strength to take the risk necessary to transform our professions and our society. In peace to all of you, and I look forward to any comments and reactions you have 
as my attempt to initiate these serious points for discussion can be enriched by your perspectives. Aloha to each of you.